Welcome SMPS volunteers. This is Natalie Gosner, the Chapter Services Manager at SMPS Headquarters. Thank you all for joining us today. We feel extremely lucky to have Mary Abage as our presenter. Mary is uh, president and co-founder of Career Stone in Washington, DC. Now attendees, your lines have been muted, but Mary encourages your questions. So please submit your questions via the questions box and I'll pass them along to Mary during the program. And Mary's also happy to take questions at the end of the program. So attendees, are any of you planning to attend one of our five regional conferences taking place in 2018? I want to encourage you to please plan to join your society board and staff at the chapter leader workshop that are taking place at each one of these regional conferences. And at the workshop, we're going to offer a recap of Mary's program today during the workshop. And at that time, we'll encourage you to share your thoughts and insights gleaned from today's program at the workshop. Very exciting. There's also a handout attached to this program that you can download take, uh, for the, provides you the opportunity to take some notes during Mary's program. Today's program is being recorded and will be made available to all chapter volunteers on the SMPS YouTube channel. Welcome, Mary Abge. Are you ready to begin? I am ready. Good afternoon, everybody on the East Coast, and good morning to everybody on the West Coast. We've got a snowy little day here in Washington, D.C., about an inch, just enough for people to stay home in their pajamas and schools to be closed. So it was great to be here today. Thank you very much, Natalie, and thank you, Mary Cruz, uh, for inviting me on this uh, to do this webinar today. So we've got a jam-packed, you know, 45 minutes to an hour or so. I'm going to try to leave some uh, room for questions at the end. And as Natalie said, I'm happy to take questions as we go. So what we're going to be talking about today is considerations for volunteer leadership. So we're hoping to have today is to have, have an opportunity to talk with you about some tips and tricks tips and tricks and techniques to make you uh, a really great volunteer leader. And everything we're going to talk about today, um, not only will it work in your volunteer leadership life, but all of these strategies and ideas should work also as well in your regular workaday life, as well as some of them are going to work in your personal lives too. So with that, we're going to get started. Um, and hopefully my computer is not frozen as been sitting here for a while. Uh, so let's see. And it did. Uh, let me see. Move my slot. There we go. All right. Uh, so a little bit about me. Um, first of all, I am a professional facilitator, a trainer, a consultant, and now I am an author. I'm about to release a book called Managing Up, which is going to be out in March, and hopefully it'll be really exciting. It's a new thing for me to do. A little more about me. I'm the past board chairman of a leadership group here in Washington, D.C. called Leadership Greater Washington. Um, so I've served on, and I've served on boards for about 14 years and have led probably every committee possible and has led the whole board. So part of what I'm going to talk about is uh, I've learned from a hard, hard core experience, but also really flowing and exciting. Uh, I'm also an introvert, although uh, Mary Cruz and Natalie have asked me to be an extrovert today. Uh, introversion is my natural preference. I'm also bossy, opinionated, impatient, competitive. I'm a type A, and I tend to be a little bit of the know-it-all. And finally, I'm a Gemini. And the reason why I say that is because as we talk about things, it's really important that you start to really know who you are as a leader. So being really honest with yourself about who you are, both your blessings and your awards. So being bossy, opinionated, and patient, competitive, type A, know-it-all can work well for me sometimes, but more often than not, those are the things that don't really go that well with uh, being a volunteer leader. So it's important to really know yourself, and we'll talk about that a bit more. So what we hope that you take away today are a couple of things. We're going to spend some time talking about leadership, what it really means. What does it mean to be a volunteer leader? And where are you as a volunteer leader? In other words, like what are the skills and the qualities you have and what might you need to develop a little bit more of to be really successful in the context of volunteer leadership? We're going to talk about the importance of conducting truthful and productive conversations. Um, oftentimes it's not fun to do it at work and it's certainly not fun to do it with volunteers and often people don't do it as well as they could. So we're going to talk about how to do it and the importance of it. We're also going to talk about delegating and holding others accountable, uh, key skills for being an important, uh, to being a successful uh, volunteer leader. And finally, we're gonna talk about engaging volunteers effectively. Uh, one of the challenges, as you know, uh, when you're on volunteer committees or volunteer boards or associations of any kind is 
keeping people really engaged. I'm going to give you a couple of tips at the end for how you can really ensure high engagement. Now, normally, if you were in front of me, person to person, I'd say, do you have any questions? Uh, but since I can't see any of your hands, I'm going to assume that you love what I just said, and we'll go ahead and move forward. So, uh, what is leadership? Lots of definitions of leadership. I mean, there's been tens of thousands of books written about leadership, and when it really gets down to it, well, leadership is in the 21st century. It's the process of influencing others to achieve a common goal. So we are not um, a, a country full of Vladimir Putins. Like, we don't necessarily have the power. We can't jail people for not listening to us. So at the end of the day, leadership is about influencing others to achieve a common goal. And this is especially true for volunteer leadership. Volunteer leadership, because people are volunteers, you can't make them do things, you can only influence them to do things. And how we influence people is really important, and that's a key thing of leadership. And we influence people by the way we treat them, how we interact, our choices, our behaviors, our actions, our attitudes, our words, our deeds. So therefore, leadership development is really about self-development. It's about understanding who you are, who you need to be, and can you exercise that sort of emotional intelligence that you need to be an effective leader? Because as we said before, leadership today is more about influence and not authority, and that is very true for volunteer leadership. So we're going to start the day really talking about that self-development piece. What is it that you need to bring forth into the world, into your volunteer leadership world to be successful? So I've identified three what I call critical conversations for success uh, with volunteer leadership. The first conversation is probably the hardest uh, and the most important, and this is the self-conversation that you have to have. These are the conversations that you're going to be like a crazy person talking to yourself, but this, this is the first step to really understand uh, with yourself, what are you trying to accomplish and, and, and how you need to do that. And so we're going to go into that in detail in a minute. The other main conversation we're going to cover today is how you have conversations with other members of your committee, of your board, your team. What are those kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations that are important to have to keep people engaged and on track? And then the third conversation we're going to talk about is that we call these meeting conversations. So oftentimes uh, the work of uh, uh, volunteer committees, uh, boards, is, is done at meetings, right? They're a important way that we communicate and that we align and coordinate our activities. And so we're going to talk, I'm going to give you some tips at the end uh, around how to have really great meetings, um, how to keep the work productive and keep those conversations on track. Uh, so those are the third, that's the third critical conversation for success. So well, let us start at the beginning, and the beginning is always taking a look at ourselves. It's about self-development. So when you have these conversations for success, I like to think of them in a couple of ways. One, being really clear, what kind of leader are you, right? I am bossy and I'm opinionated. That's going to work for me sometimes. I got to tell you, a lot of times, most times it doesn't. So we have to be clear about what kind of leader we are. That's the first part of the conversation with yourself. The second part is Knowing who, what kind of leader you are, then you need to take a look at what does the organization need? Where is the organization? Where is the committee? Where is the team? What are you working on? What's the goal? And what kind of leadership do, does, do the people on that team need, do the people on that committee need, and does the project need? So you want to take a look at who you are, what you're bringing, and what is needed. And then the third piece of this conversation with self is given that it's really basically a gap analysis, given what the organization needs and what you are, what do you need to be? So we want to look at the areas where we need to be. For example, when I first took over chairman of the board of Leadership Gray Washington, I know I'm bossy opinionated. I want to move things forward. The organization needed things to be moved forward as well, but they also needed a little bit of love and attention, and they needed to, and I needed to slow down. So I had to really shift my natural leadership uh, kind of inclination into a leader that could actually build a lot of consensus, uh, take the time, and be patient. And so these were skills I had to learn, and I wouldn't have done that had I not taken the time to really think through carefully 
what the organization needs and what I need to do to change in front of it. So in order to find out what kind of leader you are, if you ever, by the way, have a chance to take a 360, you should totally do it. You should always be looking for feedback from other people. You should believe what people tell you-ish, right? Um, you're looking at, but you want to start with yourself and what you think. So a little exercise I like to give out is this one. It's really simple. I want you to write up to 10 qualities, attributes, skills, objectives that describe you as a leader. Now, I'm going to, if we were in a room together, I'd make you do this and I'd make you talk with each other, but for now, I'm going to assign this to you as homework. And it's really important to think about. And when you think about your uh, 10 qualities, attributes, skills, adject adjectives that describe you, um, I want you to include both your blessings and your warts, right? And don't judge them. Just really list them. Do a, a real honest, rigorous self-assessment. Now, I know from doing this exercise hundreds of times that half of you will have no trouble, trouble thinking of 10 adjectives, and half of you are going to have a lot of trouble thinking of adjectives. And so I'm going to really encourage you that if you can't find 10 words that describe you, then I'm going to encourage you to go to someone that you trust, someone that maybe you work with every day, um, someone that knows you, or someone maybe doesn't know you that well even, like anybody, and see if you can't really get that list of adjectives. Because this piece of self-awareness of how you really are are, how you really impact people, how people perceive you is really, really important. So I'm going to hopefully um, encourage all of you to have this list of qualities uh, thought about and done before you go to the conference. All right. So once you have that kind of list of who you are, I'm going to um, tell you some of the um, attributes that successful volunteer leaders usually have. And so hopefully you'll see some of these on your list. So first of all, Successful volunteer leaders are also good volunteers themselves, meaning that when they're doing volunteer leadership, whether it's a committee, whether it's a board, whether it's a task force, whether it's a project, they bring the same passion, the same sincerity, and the same action that a good volunteer does. It's the same sort of idea that a good follower also makes a good leader. It's the same kind of passion that you want to, you want to bring. Um, because if you're not a good volunteer and you're the leader, you're, you know, you're not going to be modeling good volunteerism. So people will respond to leadership when they model the values that they bring as well. Uh, the successful volunteer leaders have to be visionary. So you have to be able to see into the future and set a goal and to set landmarks and put stakes in the ground. Now, you don't all have to be Steve Jobs. You, doesn't, you don't have to have some like revolutionary uh, industry breaking idea, but you do have to have a sense of direction and it should be something that feels a little bit different and a little bit inspiring to, to the people who are, you're gonna be working with. Um, you wanna be inclusive, so again, uh, one of the things about engagement is to include people. So successful leadership, uh, volunteer leaders are inclusive. They ask people's opinion. They let, get them involved. Um, they uh, uh, find out what they want to do. We don't make decisions by, you know, being an autocrat. So we include other people along the process in there. Uh, also, successful volunteers are very transparent. Uh, people will trust you when they believe they know what you are doing. Uh, inspirational. This goes along with visionary. Like you can have a vision, but then you've got to have that sort of emotional intelligence that inspires people and encourages them to actually want to work hard for you and for the organization because everybody has day jobs, right? Um, and then generous. We need to be generous with our time, with our thank yous, with our sense of involvement, um, with our praise, with our inclusion. So being generous is a really key aspect for sex successful volunteer leaders. Uh, so those are some of the qualities. Now I'm going to dig down the, uh, for a minute and talk about the actual behaviors. Behaviors are the things that we do. They're the actions that people actually see. And these are a handful of really important specific behaviors that successful leaders, uh, both volunteer and otherwise, have. Um, first of all, they put the needs of the organization first. I'm sure many of you have had the uh, delight of working for somebody who didn't do this, and you can feel how that feels. Like, I'm sh not sure if any of you have ever worked for a narcissist or someone whose ego was more important than the team or the organization, but you probably didn't feel very inspired. So you always want to put the needs of the organization in front of your needs and make sure that people know that. You want to spend a lot of time asking great questions, asking for input, 
asking for ideas and then listening to them. Uh, you don't want to be the kind of leader that asks for input and then ignores it all. Um, doesn't mean you have to use it all, but people need to feel heard. They want to feel included and heard. You also want to create a welcoming environment, and this really means making people feel, this is just being warm. This is like, come on in, we want your ideas, uh, you want your meetings to be run so that people have a chance to engage, so creating a welcoming environment. Matching needs to the people. This is really important. In order to do this, you need to know your people. So let's say that I am a volunteer leader. Let's say I'm running a committee on fundraising. Um, I'm going to match the, what I need from that with the people and their skills. So I want to find out who's interested, who has a big network. I'm going to try and get people involved uh, with projects that are, that are aligned with what they like to do and what they're good at doing. Um, you need to be able to state expectations clearly. Here's what I expect from you. Um, this leads into delegation. We'll be talking about more uh, uh, thoroughly uh, later on in this uh, workshop. You have to be able to coach, mentor, and give feedback, which we will also be talking about. Um, people need to know where they stand um, and, and holding people accountable. Uh, and when you tell people the truth, you do them a favor. So we're going to talk about your ability to do that. Communication, of course, like in any leadership or teamwork is important. Uh, you want to reward people. Um, you're going to be writing thank you notes. You're going to be saying thank you. You're going to be shouting out. That's going to be very helpful. And then finally, it's patience. Um, as I'm sure all of you that have ever run a committee um, with volunteers, you're going to have to be a little patient. You want to spend a little more time building consensus, and that takes time. And people um, aren't always timely in their leadership, I mean, in their volunteer commitment. So a little bit of patience is going to go a long way in being a successful leader. All right, so at the end of the day, uh, what kind of leader do you, know, you want to be? Not an autocratic leader because it does not work. You want to be inclusive in your decision maker making. People will support what they help to create. And remember, including people takes time. Uh, this was a big lesson for me um, as I took over my first volunteer leadership position. Very different than being a leader in my own, in my own business. So um, uh, take the time, get people involved, and they will support you. All right, so now you've talked about what kind of leader you, you, uh, you have. We know what some of sort of the leadership uh, qualities that, uh, that often work. Uh, the next piece is really understanding where your organization needs. And I don't quite have a slide on this, but you'll have to do a quick assessment. Um, what are you trying to accomplish? Where are the organizations? How motivated are your committee members? What's needed? Are you forging a whole new path? Or are you just tweaking the edges? Either one is great, but understanding what is needed and then doing a gap analysis. And then you get to say to yourself, what do I need to be? So what do I need to achieve? What kind of team do I need to do that? What skills and qualities or attributes do I have that's going to help me? And what are some skills, qualities, attributes that I'm going to need to learn and develop? Uh, and this is where then you really get uh, clear with yourself, you know what, to do this particular project or lead this committee, I've got these pieces all, all you know, these are in my, in my back pocket. I'm going to need to work on being more patient or I'm going to need to work on maybe being uh, a little more direct with people. Uh, but taking a good, uh, a good, uh, um, uh, census of who you are and what you need to be will be the, one of the best things you can do as you begin to lead. So that is conversations with self. Any questions? Looking at see nothing. So I'm going to keep going, but feel free to uh, send a question if you have anything as we go, and I'm happy to take it. Uh, so now that you've got, you know, good self-awareness and you've had this great conversation with yourself and you know exactly who you are and who you need to be, and maybe you even have a little mantra about how you uh, want to lead a little differently uh, for the context at hand, the next part of the critical conversations for success are those conversations that you have with your members, your teammates, et cetera. And we call these leader member conversations. Um, and there's three real big ones that we have noticed in the volunteer world that are really important and often aren't done as effectively as they could be. Uh, the first one is delegation. And this is how clear are we when we actually delegate a task or when we ask someone to work on a project or do a deliverable, um, then the next conversation that needs to be uh, had or at least needs to be able to be had, and this is the one of accountability. 
um, what happens when someone says, I'm going to take care of that, and it doesn't get done. Uh, and I know from doing this workshop many times that this is a very difficult conversation for many people. By the way, it's very difficult for many people in the regular world of work, and I think it's uh, having volunteers adds another uh, layer of um, complexity and maybe resistance to doing it. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, uh, the engagement conversations. How, what kind of conversations can you have to make sure people are engaged? So those are the three uh, leadership conversations that we have. We call, I kind of call these one-on-one -on -one conversations among members. Uh, and so let's start with delegation. Okay, so delegation at first blush seems really obvious, right? You have a request, which is what you, the leader, may be doing as you are requesting support or, um, or involvement on a project. And then you have what we call the commitment. This is when the person who is being delegated to or volunteering to take on the responsibility, what they commit to. And these are two really important parts of a delegation um, conversation. So let's start with the first one, a request. And by the way, it could actually start with a commitment. Someone could volunteer and say, I'm going to do that. And even if they do, you still need to make the request. So let's start with the request. Uh, so four parts of a delegation request. One, your request has to be really clear. What exactly are you asking them to do? When do they need to do it? How are they going to do it, perhaps, if that's part of it? But you've got to be really clear. There's a big difference from saying, you know, I need you to research potential speakers at our annual meeting to saying, I need you to research, uh, send me a list of the top five of your uh, choices for speakers, how much they cost, and the topics that they're, that they're going to speak on. Um, so there's a real big difference. Um, I just read a great study that said 75% uh, of the reason why people don't get their needs met at work is because they're not making clear requests. Uh, and that's really stuck with me lately. Like, are we really being clear in our requests? Uh, the second part of a delegation is really uh, kind of follows from that. It's really what are the conditions of satisfaction? So this means the details about what you're looking for. If this request or this project or this delegated task is done well, what does success look like? Um, this is when you need it, the boundaries, et cetera. The third part is talking about their authority and boundaries of empowerment. Um, and this can be really important and easily overlooked as well. So this is, for example, if I am, if I'm asking somebody to go research speakers, am I telling them they're allowed to hire them? Am I telling them they're allowed to talk about our budget? Uh, what am I, what do I, what are those kind of boundary questions and authority questions of empowerment? Um, or, or do I want them to just uh, get vague information and send it back to me? Whatever it is, it's fine, but make sure it's clear. And then finally, uh, having a confirmation of shared understanding. So this is when after you've delegated and made your clear request that the requestee, the delegatee, because they uh, um, says, yes, here's what I'm going to do. And you do a recap. Basically, it's a recap. Okay. So, um, again, I'm just going to repeat this. Uh, some of the things you want to include in your clear request uh, under uh, those four areas are really clearly communicate about your expectations. Um, I know that this might be easier for extroverts than introverts. A lot of times I find working uh, in the world of introversion, that, and I am an introvert, uh, that we may be clear in our head, uh, but we don't necessarily share all of our information. So being really clear about what are your expectations, the when, the how, the who. Make sure you set estimated timelines. All too often we just toss a project. I mean, I do this all the time with my staff. Um, I'll be like, hey, can you do X, Y, and Z? And then I forget to tell them when I need it. Um, so even those of us who teach this all the time still fall prey to uh, forgetting to do it well. So setting estimated timelines and making sure people understand that. You also want to make sure that people who you're delegating to have uh, the adequate resources, and this I always handle by actually asking the questions. Do you have the time? Do you have the resources? Is there anyone else whose support you need to get this done? And you really want them to start thinking about it. Again, clearly stating the level of authority. I've seen projects where um, uh, just a friend of mine called me the other day. She was, uh, she is the uh, 
the board chair uh, of a very large organization here, and she had delegated something to the president, and uh, he went off and signed a big contract that should have been approved by the board. And she and I had to tell her, I said, you know, you didn't clearly tell him that he didn't have the authority to do that. So she kind of had it uh, is in a difficult position. So you want to really make sure you're clearly stating the level of authority. And when you're delegating, I want you to be thinking about when do you want them to check in? What's the feedback look like? Do you want them to just come back to you when they have their 10 names? For example, if you're asking them to, uh, to, um, uh, research speakers, or are you saying then, you know, give me, you know, a week by week where you are? And again, I'm not going to say one way is better than the other, but just make sure you are clear and the delegatee is clear. Uh, and by the way, when you're being delegated to, these are questions that you should ask. You should make sure if the person delegating to you isn't giving you this information as a delegatee, as someone who is receiving a task, it really is your job to go and ask for these. Um, oftentimes, delegators, they simply don't think about doing this. So it's a two-way street and it's a partnership to do this. All right, so when you delegate to somebody, you're going to look for a response, right? This is the commitment part. And uh, a response may be, yes, I accept that responsibility. I'm on it. They might say, um, nah, nope, can't do it too much or whatever it is. Uh, so they may decline and say, yep, not interested. Um, they might make you a counter offer. They might say, you know, I can't research a list of speakers but I'm happy to suggest some topics that I think would be interesting to our membership. Um, or they might promise to support, and this could look like, you know, I can't do that. I think that, can't take that on. But if you, um, I can support, you know, Josie doing it. I'm happy to collect bios of people that she finds or something like that, like promise to do a, a supporting role. Or they might request clarification, um, and that's which is good. Maybe they just need to clarify um, what it is you need. And so this might be like, mm, I could do this, but maybe I could do it like if I could have two weeks. So these are some responses that you may have. So you want to work through these all. Just make sure that at the end of the day that you guys have a shared understanding of these three things, right? And you get the shared understanding by actually saying, recapping, so here's what I think is going to happen. Is that right? And you get them to say yes or, you know, or correct you. But you need to have a shared, confirmed, shared understanding of what everyone's going to do. Now, you have a shared understanding, right? Um, so let's just make up a story here. Let's say I have asked Natalie Cruz, Natalie, I'm calling you up on the spot. I have asked Natalie Cruz to research a list of potential speakers and topic areas uh, for the next conference, okay? Um, and I said to Natalie, uh, I'd like I'd like ten different speakers on three different topics, and the three areas are employee engagement, managing up, and marketing to millennials. I don't know which of the three we want, but I want a couple of uh, of ideas for each of them. I'm also looking for speakers who are not white men. Um, I can't spend more than three thousand dollars. Um, and I need this by, um, you know, in, uh, let's say, what's it, say January uh, 19th, uh, 18th, I need, or 17th, I need these by February 5th. Uh, you're welcome to tell people a little bit about our budget. I want you to share our dates, um, et cetera, et cetera, okay? We have a confirmed understanding. Natalie is going to go ahead and do that. She's going to have all this to me by, of course, I forgot what I just said, by February 5th. Um, and we're going to move forward, right? So uh, let's say, so we've set expectations jointly. I've ensured commitment. I've actually followed up an email uh, to Natalie. I've said, hey, Natalie, thank you so much for helping me out on this. Here's what I'm seeing you're going to do. Now, this part is optional, uh, but I highly recommend it. Just to recap, people are busy. I don't think you want to necessarily make a contract out of it, but a little recap. And let's say um, I'm going to follow up with Natalie, and let's say uh, I'm going to follow up with her a week before. Maybe that's what we agreed on. I follow up with Natalie, and uh, guess what? Natalie hasn't done anything, or maybe she's done like a little bit. 
So now I need to give her feedback on it and hold her accountable. Uh, and Natalie, just so you know, I know you would never not do it. <laughs> I'm just going to use you as, a, as an example. <laughs> so now we've got to hold Natalie accountable. And I'm going to give you a little model for accountability. But before I do, I want to talk a little bit about what keeps us from holding people accountable. Uh, in the real world, of, not in the real world, but, you know, in the paid world of work, uh, uh, we're a little bit better at this, but honestly, I know the number one problems in organizations stem from uh, managers not giving people feedback or holding them accountable when things first happen. We get called in a lot uh, for situations that have gone awry and it all could have all could have been fixed way, way back when a manager could have given an employee a piece of feedback or held them accountable. So I want us to realize that this is part of the role of leadership. And I know many of you are thinking, oh my gosh, you know, but these people are volunteers and they're always so busy and who am I to hold them accountable? But I want to remind you that your volunteers are adults and they are adults who have made adult commitments. That sounds kind of dirty, but you know what I mean? They've made adult commitments that they are in choice to be on this committee. They raised their hand, they volunteered, and as they are leaders as well, um, and active team members, people need to take responsibility for their ownership. So I want you to, um, to kind of, if you can, quell that little grumbling in your head that says, I can't hold volunteers accountable, because you absolutely can. Uh, it should be an honor and a privilege to serve on your committee and your board. You are doing great work. And if people can't hold themselves accountable, then you're going to step in and help a little bit. So that's what I just want to say about that. And the other thing about accountability is it doesn't have to, it isn't a conversation of conflict. It's a conversation of check-in. So I want you to frame it in your head that you're going to go into this accountability conversation. You want to do it in a way you can't go in angry. You can't go in upset. You want to go in curious, but you want to go in firm, right? You want to go in with the goal of trying to solve the problem uh, that is now arising because there, you know, this, this work was not done. Okay. So, providing feedback, holding people accountable, here's how you do it. Uh, you want to review the specific situation and the commitment. This is why it's really helpful if you followed up um, and if you've done a great job in delegation, because if you didn't do a good job in delegation, it's very difficult to hold people accountable. So, um, and you're going to refer to the agreed upon expectations. You're always, and this is so key, ladies and gentlemen, you want to start with sharing your perceptions, the progress as you see it, and the impact of whatever's happening. And you want to use I statements. You do not want to start these conversations with you. The minute you start saying you, then you are putting people on the defensive. You're simply going to share, and they can disagree with that, but it's hard to disagree with someone else's speaking from the I statement, okay? You're going to explore their perspective, so you're not shaming or blaming. You're just stating the facts as neutrally as possible without any label, without any judgment. Then you're going to explore their perspective. Uh, then you're going to determine ways to resolve unmet expectations. So this is where you're going to like problem solve together. Uh, you're going to provide assistance as needed. Uh, you're not just going to hold them accountable and walk away. They haven't done this for a reason. Since there are volunteers, you're going to try and find the help that. And then you're going to reset expectations and commitment. So here's what it might look like. So Natalie, can you play? Absolutely. All right, so um, so I'm going <laughs> to – I didn't warn Nelly ahead of time, so I hope this works. Uh, all right, so I'm going to start from the top. I'm going to review specific situations and the commitment and the expectations, and I'm going to do the first three bullets, okay? Um, so, hey, Nelly, I, I need to talk to you about the speaker, um, the, uh, about the speaker project that you're working on. Okay. Great. So if I remember correctly from, you know, uh, on July, on January 17th, we talked about you were going to uh, research some speakers for us. Uh, you were going to look at speakers um, in those three categories, the engagement, the managing up, and the marketing to millennials. And you were going to try to get uh, uh, at least um, 
at least uh, about 10 speakers, three to four in each category, and you were going to get their rates, their bios, and we we're going to try not to have all white men uh, in, the, in the list because we want some diversity. Um, and you had agreed you would have me a list by uh, uh, February 6th. So it's February 6th. I don't have the list. Um, I I am a little I'm a little um, uh, worried. Uh, I were the conference is in four weeks from now, and I I have the committee asking me where the names are. So I just want to check in with you, uh, see where we are, um, and see what's going on. So what is it? What's your take on the situation? Um. Well, Mary, I understand your concern. You were very clear with your expectations. Um, I took good notes. Um, I have a sense of what you want. Um, however, at this point, I know you wanted 10 speakers. I have eight speakers on the three topics, so I'm still looking for two more speakers, and I'm kind of stuck as to where to, where to go out and find them. Got it. Great. All right. Why well, didn't you hit it? having eight? Is good. That's a good start. Um, I do know we want ten. So what? Uh, what's like? How can I help you? Can you know? Maybe we can grab a cup of coffee later today, and I can look at your list, and maybe we can brainstorm together where we might find a couple more. Oh, that would be fantastic. All right, great. Well, I'm glad to help. You know what? I'm also going to invite Mary Cruz because she is a she's a Rolodex that you know would is amazing. So why don't um, I, I'm looking at Mary's calendar? Can we talk at four o'clock this afternoon? Uh, four o'clock would be perfect. Great. All right, I'll send the calendar. We'll set that, and then let's see if we can't reset. Um, uh, maybe give us another more week to get uh, a couple more people, and we'll we'll brainstorm this afternoon and get started. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for your understanding. Oh, you know what? And thank you. I really appreciate um, this conversation, and I'm looking forward to um, moving forward. Great. All right. Big round of applause for Natalie. That was awesome. So that's how you do it, and it's not hard. And as long as you, as long as you are kind, and you are assertive, not in like an assertive, uh, like you know, nah, 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 but like. I was honest, like you, t you, you, when you tell people the truth, you do them the favor. Uh, so you want to be respectful. So then what would happen is, you know, at our four o'clock meeting, we're going to reset expectations, ensure commitment, and the whole thing starts again. And then maybe a week from now when I'm having the feedback and accountability conversation, it's really more of like, Natalie, you did an awesome job sort of conversation. So that's what it looks like. It seems a little scary, but this framework, I promise you, I'm going back to it just so you can see it. If you follow that framework, it works really, really well. And you do want to make sure when you get down to here, just um, exploring their perspective, you want to really hear them out. Don't let people take you down rabbit holes of this or that, but really, but really explore. All right, so that's holding people accountable. Try it, you guys, this stuff works at work too. All right, the next thing is engagement, right? We've all had disengaged volunteers, and people get disengaged for a lot of reasons. One, uh, they, they're, um, we give them unclear expectations about what it means to be engaged or how we can involve them. Uh, people get disengaged when they're not comfortable with their given assignment, and this is why it's really important to, to match uh, the work with, with people's needs and skills. People will get uh, disengaged when they just serve for too long, you know? Um, they just get burnout. Like how many years can you be in a committee or be on a board or do the same volunteer and do the same thing? People can get burned out. Or they're not in the right role. Um, the time I had to lead the governance committee, I was just like, oh, my God, just boring. It was not the right role for me. So these are some reasons why volunteers get disengaged. So in order to get them reengaged, because, again, you're going to need engaged volunteers if you're leading a committee or a task force or a project, a couple things you want to do. And my introverts in the room are probably going to go, like, groaning right now because this actually takes time. I mean, really getting to know them, using your personal impact, personal positive impact to engage people is really key. So you're going to want to meet with them, grab a coffee, grab a lunch, uh, go out for a drink, or, you know, do a conference call. The face-to-face -face works really well. And just be honest, like express their desire to get them engaged. It might be like, Natalie, you know, you know I've noticed uh, that you don't seem really as engaged as you used to be, and I really, I really need your help, and I want to see you engaged. Um, this is where I'm sharing my observation. So, you know, I'd love to talk to you about, like, like are you feeling engaged? What's, you, what's your feeling about it? And we're going to hear from Natalie and then we're going to explore ways to increase engagement so Natalie what would make you more engaged is there anything that you would like to do that you're not doing are there ideas or thoughts you have um, for your involvement 
et cetera, et cetera, and find out what they want. And maybe Natalie says, you know, I just need to coast for six months. Ask me in six months again, or maybe I have a lot going on, or, or my dog is sick. Um, but you want to really have this conversation. It's kind of like a stay interview if you did one at work, like, like how can we get you more engaged? What would you like to do more of? Lots of and things like that. But have the conversation, and don't be afraid to say, you know what, I think you could, you know, I, I want more of you. I want more of your engagement. You have great talents and brings. What can I do to get that? Um, so I have these conversations. You, they're, they're great. And even if you don't get them engaged, people will be flattered that you want them engaged. Um, and sometimes this will also help people who need to roll off or need to some time away for them to say it. So it also can be a nice way to give them an out. Okay. Um, here's a standard view that I was just talking about. So by the way, you guys are going to get these slides. Any of you that are team leads or managers or supervisors, these, this is a state interview. This is one of the best things you can ever do for your people to find out what they really want. I love the state interview. It's fantastic. All right. So we've talked about this conversation you need to have with yourself. We've talked about three critical leader, member, uh, team conversations delegation, um, uh, accountability, uh, and engagement. Now we're going to talk about uh, meeting conversations. So the work of many volunteer organizations, task force projects are done in meetings, right? This is where you're bringing people together and they're conversing about what they are doing. This is when we align our project, we align our actions, we align everything together with a group of people. So a couple things about building your agenda and your expectations. So you wanna make sure when you're creating a meeting agenda or you have a project agenda, you know what I mean? Uh, share it with people, let people know where your North Star is um, or co-build it, like sit down with your committee and say, where are we going to try and accomplish uh, this year? So this, when we're talking about this agenda, I'm talking about um, overall agenda. Uh, you want to be clear when you are talking with your uh, committee that you are clear about your expectations, both formally and informally. I expect this committee to be the best committee. I expect us all to be engaged. It's probably going to require a couple hours every week from people, whatever it might be. Make sure you are clear as the leader what your expectations are. Also set your priorities. Say, you know, we want to accomplish as much as possible, but it's these three things that are really important. So for example, I was on the board of William Mammoth Theater, it's a theater here in town, and, and when we were building the building, and there was literally like uh, the board chair said, we have three priorities this year, build the building, get the money, and fill the seats. Like, it couldn't be any clearer than that. And then confirm roles. If you have roles people are taking on in your committee, uh, make sure people understand that those are the roles and that you understand what the roles are. So you're going to be running your meetings. And I know many of you have to use Robert's Rules of Order, which I hate, but I had to learn when I was uh, being on the board for so many years. And I think Robert's Rules of Orders are great for uh, decision process, if you will, like making sure you are staying along the rules, but they are not really good for engaging conversations. So when you are you doing uh, leading meetings, being a great meeting leader is fantastic. And remember, some of the key qualities uh, that people like to see when they volunteer, they want to be included, they want to be engaged. So your role when you are leading meetings is to maximize member motivation and participation in the group discussions and programs. If you are running your meetings as nothing but report outs, people are going to start falling asleep. So you want to, in every meeting, not that you're not going to do report outs, but you want to make sure you set your meetings up in ways that people are engaging and there is discussion. Um, one of the things that can help you do that is using ground rules. Um, so there, these are lots of ground rules. I'm sure you know what they all are. A couple that I like that I think are important um, are well I love timeliness I think when people when you're talking about volunteers people are busy and I think you need to start your meetings on time and end them on time uh, which means having a great agenda and sticking to the timelines if people are late to your meetings you do not recap for them um, you want to keep your meetings moving forward and respect people's time uh, a couple of the things that can help is uh, keeping people on track with one conversation one topic uh, so stay on track on the agenda uh, I often ask people in my meetings to bottom line so that um, uh, they don't uh, take up too much time, like 
no long story Larry's. E-etiquette, I think it's really important, even though they're volunteers, we all have work life, that people, if they're in the meeting, they should stay focused on the meeting. Um, and then the last one I'm going to recommend that you guys use is the uh, I can live with it uh, ground rule. And this is really around consensus making. Uh, so when people, um, when people make decisions, when you come to decisions and meetings, you want to make sure that people support the decision. So the, uh, the way that we define consensus is um, I will live with it and I will support it. It may not have been my first idea, but I will live with it. And what this helps you do, I don't know if this happens to any of you, uh, you don't want people coming back to the next meeting and revisiting decisions. So uh, making sure that people, when you reach decisions in the meeting, that those decisions stick and as people walk out of the room, they support it. Now, if you're lucky, you're going to have conflict at your meeting because conflict is just a difference of opinions and it's natural at board meetings, at team meetings, at project meetings. And this is a good thing. We get better ideas when we have differences of opinion. But what you don't want to do is, as this picture goes to suggest on our screen, that you don't want the conflict to become unhealthy. You want healthy conflict, healthy sharing of ideas and debates. And your role as meeting leader, as project leader, as team leader, as committee leader, is to resolve disputes, but you want to do so in a way that all members feel respected and heard. I'm going to give you a quick little tip for doing this. Um, so let's say Mary Cruz and Natalie Gossard are, are we're trying, trying to decide what kind of fruit we're going to have at the annual meeting. We can either have bananas or we can have oranges, okay? And let's say they're just going back and forth, bananas, oranges, bananas, oranges, bananas, oranges. So if I'm the meeting leader, I'm going to intervene and stop the action. So I'm going to say, hold on, Natalie and Mary, hold on, let me just like stop for a second so we can all follow. I'm going to separate the issues and choose the issue. So I'm going to separate it and I'm going to say, all right, so we're talking about fruit of the meeting. Is that right? Okay, so I'm going to summarize and validate. So Mary said she wants bananas because they are higher in potassium and they travel very well. Um, uh, what did I say, Nellie, want oranges, apples? More say apples. Uh, Nellie, you want apples because they're more universally liked and more people like apples and they come in different colors. Is that right? Got it. All right, so now I've separated it. Now I'm going to invite other people. All right, so we've got these two choices. We know what they want. What are other people's opinions, right? And that's when you actually get other people talking about it, right? Um, you could ask some powerful questions. Well, what if... Um, uh, what uh, what do we what do we want fruit to bring or do we even need fruit? You can ask five questions to help move that. Make sure you hear all views. You summarize again. So you might say, all right, so um, we know about bananas, we know about apples, uh, we've got a new idea, grapes over here. So now uh, I think our next steps are to. Uh, make a decision, right? So they may be make a decision, let's vote. Then make your next steps might be, you know, we need to get a little more information on the pricing because we don't know the pricing. Um, you know what, let's parking lot this till next time while we gather some more information or whatever it is. But that's how you close it out. You separate the action, summarize, validate, make sure everybody feels heard. You don't weigh in yet as a leader. Uh, summarize again and then decide what's gonna happen. Simple, easy peasy, lemon squeezy and fun actually. All right, so this is discovering consensus, what I just said a little bit about. Uh, consensus means simply I can live with that and I will support it. It does not mean that I think this is the best solution. If you go for consensus where you want everybody to agree it's the best decision and their first one, be prepared to spend a lot of time building consensus. Uh, that's not actually technically the answer, but as long as you get people to be like, you know what, it's not my first choice, but I will live with it and I'll support it, that's what you need. Okay, um, so those are my meeting tips. Um, now I'm just gonna give you a few more tips as we're closing up on time here, uh, just for being a good volunteer leader in general. One is ask for help. Like if you're drowning in it, ask for help. Your other volunteers are waiting to help you. I think we often think that as the volunteer leader, we have to work harder than everybody, anybody else. And while that may be true, you can ask for help. Um, solicit feedback. You know, go to people you trust, even people you don't trust, or not, I shouldn't say don't trust, but people that you may not uh, have a close bond with and ask them about your feedback on leadership. I got plenty of feedback on my leadership, some from people I didn't like, and you know what? They were absolutely right. They gave me a kernel of nugget of golden truth and help that was very helpful. Um, get a mantra. So when you know what kind of leader you need to be uh, and you're seeing like one of your um, 
innate qualities isn't quite matching, get a mantra. Mine was when I went to board meetings, I had to listen to everybody. It was like, it was like patience patience, patience, because uh, I just want to get to the end. Uh, do your homework. You don't want to ever walk into a, a, either a committee meeting or board meeting being surprised. That means checking with people who are supposed to do things. Uh, make sure you know what's going to happen. Again, cultivate your team members. Get to know them. Uh, when you give uh, feedback or you uh, hold people accountable, you want to shed light, not heat. Light is, huh, um, here's the facts this we're not getting we're not where we need to be uh, on this project heat is like you are a lazy disrespectful you know piece of work uh so you want to shed light not heat when you get feedback uh when you uh speak last when you're brainstorming oftentimes when the leader says here's what i think we should do then everybody follow, follows along so try and like listen to people first and then speak last um you want to stay clear of click so when you are a volunteer leader in many volunteer organizations as in any organization there's lots of clicks you want to make sure that you move among all the clicks and are not associated with just one click because uh, that helps you see, be seen as a leader to everybody um stretch your leadership muscles this isn't a great time to try new ways of, of leading um it's a great time try new things stretch your muscles and um, this experience of leading a committee or a board or a task force is a great uh, way to, to stretch your leadership muscles and finally at the end of the day it's, you know it's going to be hard you're going to be stressed but you're not solving world peace right so cut yourself some slack now and then do the best you can throw yourself in 100 percent and things that don't work you know it's not like world peace is at stake people um and that's my tip so take yourself uh, be generous with yourself be kind give it all and whatever doesn't work it's a lesson learned so huh 253 i am open for questions thanks mary remember attendees if you have a question for mary please submit your question via the chat box the question box rather so we have a lot of folks, Mary, who are who are digesting all these nuggets of information that you pass along, and hopefully they're ready to to they're formulating their action plans right now. So right, and hopefully they understand. I didn't talk too 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 fast. I want you to give your questions, people. Here's my book coming out in March 2018 called Managing Up. It's how to manage those who manage us. Um, how to move up when at work and succeed with any type of boss. It's a great book. I'm very excited about it and. Um, uh, yeah. Fantastic. Where can we where can we get your book, Mary? Oh, you can buy it. So it's already it's uh, it, it comes out I think March nineteenth. Uh, it's already on Amazon dot com for pre orders, um, and uh, so you can pre order now. I think it's at a really good price. I think Amazon has it at forty percent off for the pre order uh, thing. And if you're interested in buying multiple copies, uh, if you uh, I will come speak to your organization. I'm doing something at Turner Construction. Um, on Monday, doing something at Clark Construction next week, uh, doing something for um, the Association of Interior Designers uh, in July, um, doing something for the Legal Council and Legal Diversity on March 1st. So uh, we have a great workshop on managing up, and uh, we have presentations in many different formats. Great. And we do have one question, Mary. Oh, um, one of the attendees wants to know, what's the best way to keep your leadership skills fresh when you when you essentially have nobody leading at the time there's not one person leading if you're a volunteer if you're a volunteer um and there's nobody leading i mean you can keep your leadership skills fresh by just volunteering to take on a task right or a project ever be it so small or so large um so that's what i would do and you know and leading also if you think about leading as influencing um, anything that you get involved in, try and, you know, find a way to take a little bit of responsibility, right? Um, I'll take care of that. Um, or, you know, Joe and I will take care of that and doing that. So I would say by volunteering, by getting yourself involved, by offering to take control, not control, but take um, responsibility for getting things done. Great. And yeah. if there's nobody leading, that sounds like a vacuum of leadership. And I'd be stepping right into that, being the bossy person that I am. <laughs> But mostly volunteering to take responsibility for getting something done. Great. Fantastic. Hey, Mary. It's Mary Cruz. Hi, Mary Cruz. How are you? I'm good. Great presentation. I appreciate all your points. And I, 
uh, always walk away with, with armed with so much information. I, and I really appreciate the, um, and I have it, I'm going to write it down. I wrote it down, but shed light, not heat. And really, yeah. you know, remembering um, that and, and living by that. Cause I think it says, it speaks a lot. Um, but I, and I do recommend for um, the volunteers on the call to practice these delegation um exercises, yeah. you know, whether, you, yeah, just being able to go through and, you know, sit down and even role play, even if you feel like you don't necessarily have, if there's something right now that you need to address, but I know with our own team or in, even in my personal life, um, I'll, I'll role play from time to time with a friend or with someone, a colleague, and just say, let's, let's work on that exchange, like walking through, saying it out loud and actually role playing. Because when the opportunity arises in a meeting or, you know, with um, a volunteer leader or someone in your office, in your department, um, it's, it's, it'll feel more comfortable in going through that exercise. So I guess for me, I've, I've really taken that and have practiced, um, and role played. So I think it's been very helpful for me. Oh, I love that, Mary Cruz. And you are so right. Whenever I have to give particularly difficult feedback to someone or accountability, that's when I find role playing so helpful. Because you can get, you know, the person you role play with can be like, you, that kind of hurt. That was kind of too heat and not enough light. It uh, helps you practice the words. And for delegation, the same thing. I love that idea. So yeah, I definitely am a big fan of the role play. It feels kind of dorky at first, but then it's just, it just helps. Like just the muscle memory of saying the words is really helpful. Exactly. Great. And I guess the last thing I would say to volunteer leaders is, you know, um, have fun with it. Like, have fun. Don't forget to bring your joy to it. Um, every year I do a year, uh, word of the year because I can't quite manage to do any resolutions. And the word of my year, my word of the year this year is the word love. And I did that word because I want to remember when I'm really busy that I love what I do. And I do it out of love. And so when you're a volunteer leader, it's easy to get overwhelmed because it's like a second job. But just like remember to have fun and enjoy it and remember why you are doing it. And I will say this, I think you can get so much out of being a volunteer leader. Um, so really just take the time to kind of uh, enjoy it and appreciate it. That's perfect, Mary. We do have um, another, another question for you. Is, do you. Can you provide any tips on the best way for identifying the next leaders for the organization you are leading? Oh, I love that question. Um, question. Yeah, the people that... For, well, for, and I, what I would say personally is the people who stand up, say, I'll do that, and then actually do it. The people that, first of all, you know, take responsibility, they commit, they bring it, they make things happen, they get results and they get action. So that's the one thing I'd look for. The second thing I'd look for are the people that actually get along well with other people. Uh, so it's kind of the productivity and positivity piece. Um, those are the, the two piece, things that I would look at. Uh, if you have people who are just great people people, but they never get anything done, they're not going to be a great leader. If you have people who drive everything, but people don't really like them, that's not going to work too. So I'd look for that great, that magic uh, combination of the productivity and the positivity. Great. Well, I believe we will wrap up now. I'm not seeing any more questions. So Mary, 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 Mary Abjay, thank you so very much for this extremely <laughs> useful, extremely useful presentation for our volunteers and for the staff as well who are on this call. Um, oh, this recording is going to be made available. This recording will be made available for everybody. Um, and I'm hopeful our attendees will dedicate some time to thoughtfully digesting these nuggets of consideration that you shared and and as I said before really formulate an action plan and and share their their thoughts on the team with their team and for those of you who are going to be um, attending one of the five regional conferences again we're going to offer a discussion recap of Mary's program during the workshop perhaps we'll do a little delegation exercise Mary it'll be very exciting we'll have to let you know how that goes Please um, do. <laughs> so um, Mary President and co-founder of CareerStone Group in Washington, D.C. Thank you again so very much for presenting today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, and happy and to be here, everybody. Thank you. And SMPS volunteers, thank you for joining us. Again, this program has been recorded, and we will make it available on our SMPS YouTube channel. Thank you again, and this will end our, our program for today. Goodbye, everyone.